Um, I, I'm not going to talk so much about the Salesforce Tower today because I think there are several other speakers who are probably better prepared to go into detail of what it means to do a tall building. Uh, and I'm also very appreciative of the way John Zhang has organized all of this because indeed he is beginning with the largest of pictures and then actually focusing in on the components that really can make the city. Um, so my talk is going to be a great deal of detail. I'm going to do it really, really fast. Uh, of the transit center itself and mention of the Salesforce Tower. Uh, there's a lot to talk about. Let me start this particular slide now. I, I will say that I believe strongly that there is an emerging, entirely new attitude toward all the uh, Much, much, much less about the kind of uh, traditional assumptions about context, about, uh, about regionalism, much more about people and aspirations. And that, what that has done is that has broadened the assignment of the design of tall buildings to, we're obligated now to include not just architecture, but urban design, engineering, the environment, the culture, and lifestyle. Uh, and, and for those many, many reasons, I would say that we are in the middle of an entirely new attitude about tall buildings. And I think what I tried to do in thinking about these, these various uh, kind of components is to think about how one might apply some rules of doing skyscrapers, not just in the United States, but around the world, and how those rules might be universally applicable. Now, Obviously, this is my list. It would be wonderful to uh, to have this list argued against, or expanded, or even eliminated. Uh, but this is this is where we're coming from. This is where Paul Cartelli is coming from, both in the Salesforce Tower and, frankly, in the train center itself. Uh, John did a superb job of setting the stage. I'm not going to go into any real detail. Uh, clearly, as you can see on the left, the ultimate objective objective is to connect the entire state of California from the north to the south to the California high-speed rail. Uh, the immediate objective of the transit center is to connect some 13 uh, systems of buses, hopefully eventually Caltrain. Uh, and the transit center itself, of course, is placed and designed to be the Grand Central Station of the west, which means that not only is it a functioning building, it's a building of great symbolic importance. So, those are also the underlying objectives of what we did. Uh, the transit center has a long history. Uh, there was an interesting 1930s building that existed before us, which probably in its prime was a good building. Uh, but eventually it became like many of these buildings do. Uh, unsafe, uh, very, very poorly maintained, and inappropriate for the times. Uh, what it did have, though, is a very big footprint, about five acres. Uh, in the middle of uh, what turns out to be one of the most important and hottest real estate markets perhaps in the world right now. Um, and that footprint, again, I think all of you who go there and can see that footprint, also included several large ramps that came from the Bay Bridge uh, that took buses through the city streets. So when you take down not only the transit center, but the ramps, you actually uh, unearth an enormous amount of buildable area. This is an interesting slide. This is Beale Street as it was only about uh, 10 years ago. And if you walk on Beale Street today, you'll realize that it's an entirely new and, and much, much better environment. Uh, this has showed you how critical those old bus ramps were to one's impressions of the city. Underneath that bus ramp uh, today are some very, very important and valuable pieces of real estate. Uh, the transit center is in the middle of one of the most important uh, and most varied parts of San Francisco's urban uh, map. Uh, it happens to be in a place that is a confluence of cultural, arts, finance, obviously, recreation, in the future housing. Uh, and in this was a competition that we we uh, entered in one some eight years ago, and we realized that that this was the beginning of a new development of a new neighborhood of San Francisco, along with Peter Walker, our landscape architect, we did a great deal of research about the history of development in San Francisco. And there's a really, really interesting fact, and I think you, uh, you San Franciscans are unique in this regard. In many instances, parks actually preceded development. You know, a park was built first, and then buildings 
communities built were built around those parks. Uh, and we realized also that the roof of the new transit center, a five-acre roof, uh, was going to be essentially the fifth facade of this building, that the surrounding buildings were most likely going to be towers looking down on this roof, and they had to be able to see something. Uh, and our attitude and our approach was to make that an urban amenity. Um, and thus was born the notion of a five and a half acre, fully accessible, fully, uh, fully usable urban park. Uh, the, uh, well, uh, obviously well beyond just the notion of the green roof. For the architects in the room, in the middle of the competition, we did a very quick analysis to see if this was more or less expensive than a fancy, let's say from, for, the, for the purpose of illustration, a fancy glass roof that one sees in transit centers, it turned up this park on a per square foot basis is half the price of doing a fancy glass roof. And of course, you can't occupy a fancy glass roof. You can look down on it. It's probably going to be handsome. Uh, but it's expensive, and it really is not a public gesture, ultimately. Um, John showed you this section earlier. This very quickly shows how the building is organized. Uh, in the middle, and I don't know if I have pointer here, but in the middle is this, the ground level, uh, which connects from Mission through to Natoma. Above the ground level is the bus deck, where all 13 uh, of the system will come together. On top of that is the park. One level below grade is the waiting area for the eventual train system. And then below that is California High Speed Rail and Caltrain. All this entire structure is built. The entire below grade is built, waiting for the trains to come. Um, and we also uh, went to a lot of uh, sort of pain and analysis to see how this building might also be the very best neighbor it could be at the street level and, in the, and in, to its adjacent. Thank you. To its adjacent um, uh, and as yet the best at this time unpredictable buildings. So we spent a good bit of time on the skin of the building. Uh, as many of you know, if anybody who's been to the Port Authority bus terminal uh, in Manhattan, uh, bus stations, transit centers are usually really terrible, terrible neighbors. Uh, they actually kill development rather than, de than create development. Um, and we wanted to absolutely reverse that trend. Now New York is thinking in these terms. Uh, we're now involved in the analysis of the Port Authority bus terminal in New York. Um, and Transbay has become the model for that kind of development uh, in New York and, and other cities that we've been giving this talk in. Um, this was a building that was enormously, enormously studied, uh, both in traditional uh, three-dimensional um, uh, ways as well as more, uh, more interested in contemporary ways. Uh, but ultimately, that really the building is really about, as big as it is, the architecture boils down to three essential ingredients. One is the park. The, third, the second ingredient is the large public space that I'll show you in a few more minutes. And the third is the skin that wraps the entire building. Otherwise, this is a giant feat of engineering. Uh, and I make that point because, once again, this building is an example of the confluence of architecture, culture, and engineering uh, in a very, very interesting way. The park itself is highly varied, many, many sub-environments within it. I won't go into a lot of detail. Uh, but suffice it to say that you will be able to visit this park every day of the week and see something new. Uh, the building is also highly, highly sustainable. Uh, we decided early on that just simply being a lead-rated building, although we are lead gold, simply being a lead-rated building was really not enough uh, of a statement, not enough of, a, of a, an aspiration uh, for our project. And with the park, we've actually introduced a whole new set of things that we were able to achieve. Let me just rattle off some statistics just for a moment. Uh, beneath the entire building is the largest geothermal installation in the United States, uh, perhaps one of the largest in the entire world. Uh, the geothermal installation alone, again for the architects in the room, um, has allowed us to completely eliminate cooling towers. Now, if anybody knows what a cooling tower is or looks like, uh, you know that you really don't want to look down on one of those things from your, your, your apartment uh, just, to, just next to the transit center. So we've eliminated cooling towers. Uh, the water management system within the building, which is really the, uh, the core idea behind the park, allows us to manage 10 million gallons of 
water a year. Rainwater management in San Francisco is a huge thing. 10 million gallons of water are 15 Olympic sized swimming pools, which are really taken care of every single year. Uh, the, park, the trees in the park will capture 12 tons of carbon. Uh, it's a huge carbon sink. It's a, it's a place that, that you really want to have in the middle of a high density, very active transit based development. Um, and finally, uh, the carbon emissions control in this building is such that, in, in many ways, it, it's, it's as if you're planting two new acres of trees every single year that the building is in existence. So the building is designed to give back to the environment, not just to manage the environment, but to give back to the environment in some extraordinary ways. It's naturally ventilated. Uh, as I said earlier, the man water management system and energy management system alone are very, very critical. Uh, I'll very quickly go through the plans, the intention, and this also ties into some of the things that, that John said earlier, is that this building really touched the ground very, very lightly. That it'd be highly permeable, that you, you're able to drive and walk uh, all through it, that these are safe, safe transits under the building. So every, every street, every alley, such as Shaw Alley, will, will go through the building. Uh, the, the lower level, the retail level at the street is, uh, is really highly programmed with local retail opportunities. There's a second floor of retail, the park on the very top, the bus deck just below the park. Uh, as you go below grade, the top drawing is really the concourse level where you wait for your trains, and then beneath that is the, is the train deck itself. This is phase two. This is the concourse level where you wait for trains. Uh, and the trains below that, and we've managed to bring natural light all the way through the building from the park down into the train, train level. Let's just see if this works. So this is one of the best ways to understand it. This is an older animation, slightly out of date but it will give you a sense of just the scope uh, and, um, and um, attitude toward the development. And as you can see, this whole notion of a fifth facade becomes really critical uh, because every new building is going to look down onto the park. Uh, Peter Walker has been a superb partner in all of this. He's designed a, a really a, a amazing place, uh, full of experiences, full of details, uh, and the park itself is being considered a kind of educational opportunity as well. If you want to learn about landscape, this is one of the best laboratories for dealing with everything from wetlands to desert climates. Uh, Peter has had, a, has had a way of weaving all of those attitudes together. Uh, the park itself is also a place for art. The fountain you just saw is operated by bus movement. Uh, at the street level, uh, against, again, very transparent, very friendly, very open. This is on Mission Street. You see the Salesforce Tower on the right. Uh, Salesforce Tower it also itself meets the ground in a very light, transparent, and open way. Uh, during the days of the competition, we had a roof over what we're calling Mission Square, which is a large open space that fronts onto Mission. Uh, that roof has disappeared. The grove of redwoods, I think, are still, are still there although being discussed with Salesforce. Um, and within that grove of redwoods is a funicular that John mentioned that will take you from Mission Square up to the park level itself through the redwoods. Inside the building, uh, this is what we're calling the Grand Hall. The centerpiece is a column of light that is both a structural device as well as a way of bringing light, literally daylight, from the park level all the way down into the concourse below. At the bus level, if any of you remember the old, uh, the old transit center, it was dark and gloomy. This bus level is very bright, very open, very safe. Uh, wayfinding is clear. Now you're down at the train level. Once again, we're bringing natural light deeply into the train level. Um, and uh, it's, it's roomy, it's very well organized very clear and, and very importantly quite quite safe. A uh, great place to meet your friends. <laughs> I think they're friends, I'm not sure. <laughs> and then this is an interesting slide because every one of the kind of gray green prismatic buildings that you see there is a new development site that has been made available by the removal 
of the ramps, the removal of the, of the associated parts of the transit center. And of course, it all culminates uh, in the Salesforce Tower. As John mentioned, the height of the Salesforce Tower is protected, uh, and we hope will for a very, very long time, if not forever, be the, the um, tallest building in town. The transit center is wrapped in a perforated metal skin, uh, but underneath that metal skin is a complex bridge-like structure of primary and secondary structural elements uh, that undulate and wave. They're curved both in plan and section. Now, being curved in plan and section means that every piece of cladding is actually a slightly different trapezoidal shape. Uh, the, this skin needed to be perforated also because we wanted it to be naturally ventilated. When you perforate in a more normal way, a trapezoidal shape, you get very, very ragged edges. Uh, and we realized that we needed another attitude about the perforation that was not just simply in the more orthodox gridded uh, uh, kind of uh, pattern. So we looked to uh, a person who's now become a very good friend of ours, the mathematical physicist Sir Roger Penrose. Uh, if anybody's seen the theory of everything, he's in there. Um, he was Stephen Hawking's uh, thesis advisor at Cambridge. Um, and Dr. Penrose, is uh, one of his hobbies uh, is what he calls creating tiling patterns. And for a mathematician, a tiling pattern is just simply a way to describe a surface uh, with, in, in this particular instance, uh, in what he called an aperiodic way. This is a non-repeating pattern. The one we're using is the one on the right. It may look like there's a module to it. There really is not a module. It looks like it's repeating, but if you look carefully, it's actually not repeating. It's made of two uh, rhombuses, a large one and a small one, which kind of flower and unfold across the pattern. The nice thing about that, and of course, it was eventually discovered that this is the the, the atomic structure of aluminum, which is what our wall is made of. Now, this is just pure coincidence. <laughs> pure coincidence, but it's, it's great uh, cocktail party stuff. Um, but if you apply Penrose's pattern to our trapezoidal shapes, uh, you, all of a sudden your eye is led to the pattern and less so to the edges. And that pattern, after an enormous amount of this kind of brute force computer work, uh, has now been stretched through the entire building seamlessly. The hardest thing to do was to get the pattern to jump the gap from panel to panel, and it, I promise you it does. Uh, and Penrose and his wife, who's really vigilant about his ideas, both have looked at this many, many times. We've redone it many, many times, and finally he's approved it. Um, and it's going to be quite spectacular. Now, the cool thing about this, in my mind, is that this is very much about the Bay Area. Because this skin is really itself symbolic of the confluence of art, culture, mathematics, science. You can actually stand outside this building and talk about mathematics. You can talk about the history of science. Uh, there are not very, very many skins on buildings that you're able to do that with. Plus, it really, this light, lacy structure is really just extremely handsome. Here you see it behind the Salesforce Tower, crossing First Street. Uh, it meets the ground, again, very, very lightly, stops about 20 feet above sidewalk level. Uh, and in the evening, we're lighting the structure from behind so that the lace itself is in the shadow. Uh, and lends, we think, just this extraordinarily sexy, dramatic uh, image of a, if you could call a transit center sexy, I think then you've, you've accomplished a lot. <laughs> Uh, and it's now uh, under construction. So this is the roof of the transit center where we're assembling the panels. The, the, the substructure, which is a space frame, gets the panels and then they're lowered over the side of the building and bolted in place. Inside the building uh, is the Grand Hall. The Grand Hall is uh, a, a space that really connects all the way from the street level to the park. Very, very full of sunlight, full of public art. This Itself, of course, as I mentioned earlier, is uh, it's very, very green. It's, it's really a park. It's not just simply a green roof uh, with eating and entertainment opportunities. Uh, a fountain that runs almost the full length of the park is activated 
by the movement of buses through the bus deck. Uh, this is a fountain designed by a very popular San Francisco artist, Ned Kahn. Probably many of you in the room know Ned and worked with him. One of the most uh, brilliant people I've ever had the luxury to collaborate with. Uh, Jamie Carpenter from New York is designing the ceiling that, uh, that allows us to connect through with Shaw Alley uh, from Mission Street. Julie Chang is doing the floor piece. Uh, very, just extraordinarily beautiful composition of terrazzo um, with an enormous amount of detail. Julie has a whole narrative, and again, this is one, another one of those parts of it. This is a very, very large building, so what you would really like is for the 400,000 people who use it every year to hopefully see it in a different way every time they're there. So we've taken the opportunity in the public art to make it really rich and varied. We're working with Jenny Holzer to do a large piece on the wall of, of the Grand Hall itself, which you see there. Um, this gives you a sense of the scale of the Julie Chang floor piece. Uh, we use our clients as scale figures in this animation. Uh, but these are, these are real views. These are views that you will have as you move up and down from the bus back, from the park. Uh, so you can see how appropriately scaled and brightly colored Julie's piece is to make a, a truly kind of memorable, important, contemporary sense of place. The Jenny Holzer pieces are viewable from both the bus deck side and the Grand Hall side. And if you're familiar with Jenny Holzer's work, it's text-based. She's done a lot of research about the writers of the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, this is Ned Kahn's bus fountain, which indeed we're inviting kids to play in, kid or adults for that matter. I think it's going to be very, very popular. This is Jamie Carpenter's Shaw Alley underpass. And giving it a good sense of just the permeability and you know, friendliness and charm at the street level. Uh, the tower itself is 1,070 feet in height, a million three hundred thousand square feet in area. Uh, it connects by bridge to the Trenton Center Park. It's the first of three buildings that connect by bridge, uh, and it's um, and it's also the center. Of, of what is becoming Salesforce's campus in San Francisco. SOM has designed a very beautiful building diagonally across the street from us, which is the Salesforce building. They're now in 50 Fremont and many other buildings in the neighborhood. And Mission Square, which is the open space that you see on the right, is really essentially become the campus green for Salesforce, um, including the Redwoods, which we, we hope will last. There's some question about them being perhaps too uh, too dense, uh, but uh, we're still looking at that really carefully. <laughs> <laughs> Is that my bell? <laughs> <laughs> um, and once again, we work really, really closely with John's uh, John's group of people, particularly Josh Schlitzky. I, I consider actually this is a project of many, many, many parents. Uh, and John and his team are very much our collaborators. Uh, and I could, I could probably spend 30 minutes pointing to the refinements in the project that came from our work with John and his group. One other piece of art uh, done by the LA artist Tim Hawkinson that is somewhat controversial uh, is made of the rubble that came from tearing down the ramps. Uh, so Tim very carefully chose about 20 pieces of rubble uh, to make a, uh, a sculpture. Now, my friend John King has, has uh, uh, nicknamed this Barney Rubble, and I don't, know if that's a, I don't know if that's intended to be complimentary or not, John, but I'll take it as a compliment. Um, but Tim Hawkinson's idea is that if, if, you're, if you're familiar at all with the Inuit culture there, the Inuits stack rocks in the middle of these great broad plains in the Arctic, where you have no other way of knowing where you are or where you're going. And the rocks are usually turned to point you in a direction. They're pointing you north, they're pointing you toward, uh, toward shelter. Tim's idea was to take the rubble, which is essentially the rock of this neighborhood, uh, and create a sculpture which points toward the future. 
Um, and so, again, this is controversial. It's obviously uh, aesthetically very much unlike anything else around it, which personally I like a lot. Uh, but we'll have to see if it really is going to last over time. I hope it does. And it's placed right on the corner of Mission and Fremont. Uh, the tower itself is, um, has, is insulated, curved glass corners, uh, sun shades that vary in depth depending on the orientation of the building. Uh, the top is, uh, is, uh, is transparent in terms, in terms of its, its uh, effect on shadow and sun, uh, but at the same time is, has the obligation to mark, mark itself very, very clearly on the skyline. And we're actually talking about another artist, about possible permanent installations of art on the top of the tower. That's to be announced. Um, and once again, here you see it on the skyline. I think that's my last slide, so thank you very much. This is great.